Going back to dopamine, how just how triggering are our phones when it comes to dopamine? Okay, great question. Uh, we often hear that you know that social media getting dopamine hit after dopamine hit. When we first get on social media after a wall, for the first time or after a long period of time, the amount of dopamine that's released we think is quite substantial. It's novel. Remember, dopamine is about novelty, surprise, and the sense that we are on some exciting track. That's what dopamine is really about. It puts us into states of readiness, anticipation, looking, seeking, etc. Almost always for things outside the confines of our skin. Uh, just to contrast it, maybe for a bit f more of a future discussion, serotonin does the opposite. When there's a lot of serotonin in our brain and body, typically it makes us feel satisfied, sated, and more quiescent, comfortable with what we have in our own immediate sphere and within us, right? The comfort of a good meal, the food you have, dopamine is about go, go, go. If you look at somebody who's high on cocaine or methamphetamine, it's all about pursuit because that's a very dopaminergic drug. You look at somebody who's taken a drug and I'm not suggesting people do this, but that really ramps up serotonin. Let's say a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Prozac, Zoloft, etc. The side effects of those drugs, if the dosages are too high, lack of appetite, lack of libido, kind of meh about life, you know, then so they'll adjust the dose down. That's because those are serotonergic drugs. So in, in general, when we are in pursuit of things, dopamine is, is quite high. So now you have to remind me your question because I've set up the dopamine serotonin uh, parallel. Cell phones. Ah, cell phones, yes. Um, forgive me. So the thing about cell phones is when you first get on there and you haven't, let's say you're it, no Wi-Fi on the flight or something and you land, it can actually be quite stimulating. You get a lot of dopamine. Oh, there's this. Oh, there's that. But very quickly when you're scrolling on social media, you're no longer getting the novelty, but you're continuing to do it. And you almost don't know why you're doing it. At that point, it shifts over to something that's a bit more like an obsessive compulsive behavior where the, we can define an obsessive compulsive behavior where the obsession leads to a compulsion. So the obsession is a thought, the compulsion is a behavior, but the acting out of the compulsion merely serves to increase the obsession. Right. This is very different than being obsessed with food or obsessed with cleanliness. There's no payoff. Right. Exactly. There's no anxiety relief by carrying out the compulsion. With OCD behaviors, like scrolling social media, the dopamine quickly wanes. And then you find that you're just sort of, and we've all been there. You're scrolling. You're like, why am I doing this? This isn't that interesting. That is, this isn't that interesting. Now, the algorithms for social media are very clever. And I don't want to demonize it. I, you know, provide a lot of, a lot of my life is spent on, you know, on social media now, but in the algorithms that they've incorporated function on the, the most powerful way to keep people doing a behavior or an animal for that matter is intermittent random reward or random intermittent reward that you don't know when you're going to hit the jackpot. So you're scrolling, you're scrolling, and then you see something. Typically it's very high what, you know, in nerd speak, we'd say signal to noise. So if you're reading some interesting things, this came out in the news, this came out, and then it's all of a sudden a riot or a person that is jump, is base jumping off a building or, um, you know, for people that are, are scrolling, looking at bodies or something like that, uh, live bodies. So hopefully people aren't looking at dead bodies, but look, if something's very tragic, then that has this gravitational pull. And then you, what happens is you start getting the system working for that next dopamine hit that you don't know when it's going to come. It's just like gambling. So I look at social media as initially being very dopaminergic, driving reward, surprise, and excitement, but very quickly transitioning to something more like OCD and the kinds of behaviors where it looks, if you, if we were to look at ourselves through the lens of an experiment, like we would an animal experiment, we think that animal is sick. If you saw an animal digging in the corner, looking, 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 looking for a bone, the dog is looking, 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 you'd think that's really sad. That's us, right? That's us. I'm pointing at myself intentionally. That's us. So we have to learn to self-regulate the amount of time, but that doesn't have to be a process of, you know, scruffing ourselves and saying, don't do it, don't do it. Think about it in terms of the positive. The more time away from something, the more positively reinforcing it will be when you return. And that just to sort of superimpose this onto the relationship conversation, you know, many of us are fortunate to have partners that we love spending a lot of time with. 
it's also good to miss that person every once in a while. Now that might be an hour for some people apart of no communication. It might be a week. Everyone varies on this, on this spectrum. But the idea of missing someone is that positive anticipation, that kind of pain, right? It's a motivational state. And then when you see them, it's all the richer. So you can imagine that these dopamine circuits can be used to more successfully navigate a number of different things. And, you know, a lot of couples completely quash the excitement and the pleasure of being together, not just physical pleasure, but just pleasure of being together because they just spend too much damn time too much together. Familiarity. Or they're texting the, all the time, right? Or, you know, and, and this whole thing around texting has become a really interesting test of dopamine expectation. There's a thing called dopamine reward prediction error. If you think the reward is coming and it doesn't, you drop below baseline levels of dopamine. That's why you should never tell someone that this restaurant's going to be the best restaurant you've ever been to in your life. Exactly. I made the mistake of telling my girlfriend on the way here, I want her to read this book. I'm like, this is an amazing book. You should read it. And I caught myself and I thought, damn it, I'm actually detracting from how good she's going to experience the book. As. Tell her it was terrible. Oh yeah, it's it's really good though. This is the problem. It's it's hard to do. So um, I think the key is to uh, to leverage dopamine reward prediction error in the best way. It's the surprise that you know if you take kids you're driving home from school and suddenly you pull into the ice cream shop, they're going to be so ecstatic. But if you tell them you're going to go to the ice cream shop and it's closed, huge drop below baseline. Does that mean if you tell them that you're going to the ice cream shop and it's open, that's less than not telling them you're going to the ice cream shop and it's surprise? Correct. It's, it's, it, they literally tear out into maximum surprise is the maximum dopamine release. Then successful completion of the mission, so, <laughs> as it were, is the next and then unsuccessful. Is there not an argument to be made that you would be able to uh, drag out the amount of time that dopamine is released for because of the anticipation? Yeah. So, well, and people do this in relationship quite a lot, right? Anticipation is the kind of ultimate fuel of the courting dance, right? I mean, this is also, but one has to be very careful because whether or not it's from the male side or the female side or whatever variation thereof, <laughs> there's a, you only get so many reward prediction errors before people start to predict or associate low dopamine with somebody or some experience. In other words, if you, you know, uh, I'll use an example, uh, not from my own life, but if you say, you know, we're going to Costa Rica on vacation and then you say, listen, I, I have to work. They might understand, but that's a letdown. It's a dopamine reward prediction error in the direction of lower dopamine. They might recover from it. They might not, but most people recover from it. If you do that two or three times, what ends up happening, you can model this beautifully, and they've seen this experimentally in animals and humans. Then you say, okay, we're really going to Costa Rica this time. And you think, well, the surprise is going to be that you actually go. The amount of dopamine that's released for positive, for successful completion of the initial goal is far lower than it ever would have been. So you can only cry wolf. Well, so, yeah, I, I suppose that's not the right way to put it. You can only... Um, create positive anticipation so many times and then create a letdown before completion that the pro delivery of the promise has very little impact. And so you have to be very careful with one's words. Better to say nothing than to let somebody down uh, for sure in the context of human relationship. And, you know, this plays out in some um, less perhaps uh, amusing ways where, you know, you look at people who are successful in life and you always hear success builds success. And it's absolutely true. Like when students come to my lab and they do a PhD thesis, it's very important for me to get them onto a research track quickly that they're going to experience some success. Because if they spend four years and then it fails, that's the devastating. And then they have to start over again. Same thing with kids. I mean, getting some success early on, even if it's low bar success, really does build up one's positive anticipation uh, and ability to perform well in the future because dopamine gives energy. Remember, it's the precursor to adrenaline and the sense that the world is predictable. Now, this can go a wrong way too. And I see this a lot with the idea that everyone gets a blue ribbon. This is terrible too, because if everyone is rewarded, every child is rewarded regardless of how well they performed, if they're all rewarded to the same level, you actually flatten the dopamine curve. And so in that sense, yes, everyone might feel, you know, celebrated, but you actually are lowering motivation for the given activity. Uh, this has a whole landscape of, of research uh, in back of it related to intrinsic versus extrinsic reward. The strongest motivation is always going to be intrinsic motivation. If you reward kids or adults for something too many times, even if they like that activity, the 
the propensity to do that activity will be reduced. But if you reward without effort or without success, that is devastating for a nervous system. In fact, I've gone on record and I'll say it again and again and again, which is that dopamine that arrives without prior effort destroys people. This is this is drugs. This is, uh, you know, this is things like, uh, cocaine and amphetamine. It's high levels of dopamine with no effort. Okay. They had to buy it. They had to find it. They did whatever it, but that's no, there's no physical effort or mental effort involved in getting the dopamine peak. This is why hard work followed by reward. Great. Working hard on a relationship and then it gets better. Or there's a breakthrough or whatever it is. That is powerfully positive. Dopamine that just arrives because you say, Oh, you're here. So you get reward terrible. And this is why rewarding every little positive thing that a child does with, you know, their favorite thing eventually diminishes the value of that thing and diminishes their ability to get motivated on their own. So very, very powerful system. One has to be very, very careful how one leverages it.